Südafrika, Kapstadt. Die Metropole gilt als eine der schönsten Städte der Welt. Aber in eine Gegend verirren sich Touristen relativ selten. Die Cape Flats. Über eine halbe Million Menschen leben hier. Die meisten Familien hier wurden während der Apartheid zwangsumgesiedelt. Bandenkriminalität macht die Gegend zu einer der gefährlichsten der Welt. Covid-19 ist hier im Alltag nur Nebensache. Arbeitslosigkeit, Drogenmissbrauch, Kriminalität und Mord sind die bestimmenden Themen. Unser Weltafrika-Korrespondent Christian Putsch recherchiert hier seit Jahren. In seiner Doku zeigt er, warum der Ausstieg aus dem Gangalltag so schwer fällt. Ein Lagebericht aus Kapstadt. Wir stehen hier in den Cape Flats, einer der brutalsten Gegenden Südafrikas. Jeden Tag werden hier acht Menschen getötet. Das ist mehr als in ganz Deutschland zusammen. Ich recherchiere hier relativ oft, auch weil ich hier einen guten Freund habe, Glenn. Ich habe ihn vor einigen Jahren bei einer Recherche kennengelernt und äh, seitdem gehen wir zusammen zum Fußball, wir gehen zusammen laufen. Und heute wird mir Glenn seine Nachbarschaft etwas äh, näher vorstellen. Wir werden Täter treffen, wir werden Aussteiger treffen, aber auch Opfer. Wir wollen mal schauen, ob Glenn zu Hause ist. Glenn, are you at home? Glenn. Hey. How are you, man? All right, sir. How are you? Good, good, good. Nice to see you, man. Hey, nice seeing you, Chris. All right, shall we go? Yeah. Do we, do we interrupt this, yeah? Knock, knock. Hey, hey. Hey. How are you? <laughs> good to see you again. All right, all right. <laughs> Mr. Kramer, yeah. thanks so much for having me. No, no, Very no. Very much appreciated, huh? <clears throat> no, nice that you can be here again. What do we see here? Yeah, we are just busy discussing the, the actual the map of the Nova Park and where all the different gangs are zoned in. And I so see yeah. like different colors. What, what do the colors Yeah, no, the different colors is a different gang. So the one gang is the Keto Kids is in this area. Then we've got the Americans in this area and across that area here. We've got another small gang here, but they actually not uh, operational anymore. It's called the Bokis. And this side, we've got the Taliban gang on this area here. And we've got more Americans here. And in the middle here, we've got the Mongol gang. We sort of also manage how the gangs migrate and take over ground so that we can facilitate programs mm -hmm. in the right way at the right time to the right group here. Yeah. Yeah. It almost looks, almost looks like a warm-up, eh? This room here is called our, our, our war room. It's where we design all our game plans in regards mm -hmm. to how do we approach gangs, how do we set up mediations, who do we talk to first, and how do we track the transporters of violence. Kramer, I was wondering, would, would you mind if we go for a little ride? Would you no. mind just showing me your neighborhood, what's no, happening these fine. days? No, it's fine, you can drive around a little yeah. bit, yeah. Excellent. No problem. Wonderful. After the lockdown, level one, we had an we had a, we had a outbreak of violence. We 17 people got shot. 17. 17, yeah, nine died. Mm. So this is where the American territory now crosses another border. So you go through here, uh -huh. and you go to another area, and just opposite this road, you'll find the Taliban area. Okay, so a, a playground is basically the border. The playground is, is the border between yeah, two gangs. Between that gang and that gang. Now, if you look at this area, it's a contested area. It's right opposite two schools. They actually approach the youngsters as yeah, young as 12, 30 years. Oh. The, the kids can be as young as 13 years old and they'll be approached, you know. Uh, so this, this is now another headquarters here of the, 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 the Laughing Boy gang. Yeah, I'm just going to turn around here that they know I didn't drive past them. Hello, are you all right? Are you loving the sight? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's one group here, one group that side. And, and then the day hospital sits right here. Okay. This is the hospital. So uh -huh. if there's an altercation happening, then you must come to the hospital. Uh -huh. You are coming on the borderline of two gangs. So the chances that they can retaliate at the hospital is also there. You know, so this is our terminal, the city center, where the taxis get together and you, can, you do your shopping. But this is a borderline between two gangs. So, so if you're going to come do your shopping, you're in between two big gangs. Uh, again, hospitals in between, playgrounds Hospital, in between. Hospital, the playground in between, the school is on the borderlines of the gangs. Craven, is your job not sometimes a bit dangerous? I mean, sometimes you end up in the middle of conflict, sometimes yeah, you are a first responder. This is a bit of a dangerous situation, dangerous job. Yeah, but somebody's got to, you know, check up themselves and say, let's, let's do it and go out there and then raise awareness with our young people that change is possible. But when I was placed here as a minister, in this particular area, it became difficult for me just to have normal church. You know, it became difficult because what do you do? You clap hands, you sing songs, 
<laughs> and the people are dying outside and there's no food to eat. And nobody gets a job and the education is a problem. So we've gone through about four gang territories and all of them are just separated by a road. <laughs> it's not like they in different states or in different uh, uh, communities. They are just divided by roads. Ja, jetzt sind wir eine halbe Stunde hier durch äh, Hannover Park gefahren und das ist schon erschreckend zu sehen, dass äh, teilweise ein Spielplatz genau die Grenze zwischen zwei Gangs ist oder ein Krankenhaus die Grenze ist. Ähm, und ja, man, man sieht einfach, wie Gang Violence wirklich jedes kleine Element des Alltags hier äh, betrifft. Und äh, gerade eben hat mir Pastor Craven gesagt, dass es wirklich keine einzige Familie gibt, die nicht in irgendeiner Form von Gang Violence betroffen ist. Und wenn man äh, diese Aufteilung sieht, dann äh, versteht man warum. Chris, how you doing? Marwan. How you doing, Chris? Nice to see you. Nice to see you again, yeah. This is my friend, Marwan. Yeah. Hi, Marwan. Nice to meet you, Chris. So, how did you get involved with the, with the Ghetto Kids? Uh, you see, um, uh, I did see my brother. He was also a Ghetto Kid, so I see the things he do. I like the things he do, so that's the, the reason why I joined the Ghetto Kids. Uh-huh. How old were you back then? 14. Fortune. And what did you see your brother do that attracted you? He did shoot gun, he did do um, shout drugs, he did have a lo lot of money, he did buy him shoes, clothes, everything, he did have everything he needs. So why are you doing what you're doing then? Why, why are you not leaving the gang? Uh, because uh, it's still liquor for me. It's still nice for me. Uh, okay. The things I'm doing. What, what do you enjoy about it? Uh, like smoking drugs and a lot of things, man, you see. You told me earlier that you want to be a top gangster one day. But it's not worth it to be because if you want to be a general, the people is coming quick for you, you see. If you be there, the high guy, then the other gangs, they're coming very quick for you. Then you will die quicker than the normal one, you see. Are you not scared to die? Uh, I'm not scared to die. If I die, I die. Is there a way out of this situation? There's no way out. If you go into it, you can't go out again. It's like one, one door. One door in, no door out. You see? Mm. If you join the gang, you can't come out again. Jeez, man, that was, that was intense, huh? Yeah. You know what, I mean, I really, what you told me about yourself, I mean, how old are you now, 37 or something? I'm huh? 36, yeah. 36, huh? I mean, you left, he's 24, you left about 12 years ago, so you were actually his age, huh, when you left. It's, it's different for, for each individual, how, to, how you exit the gang, uh. but they, there's a time period where the gang monitor you um, to check if you are serious about your chains. Um, they monitor me for years because I was a great value to the gang. Um, yeah, but. They, they, they know that I'm changed, and I've been changed now for more than 12 years. Mm. Yeah. So for him, it's, it's totally different. Yeah. Um, the deeds, well, what is the difference? Why is it so much? You know, the deeds you do determines um, how you will leave the game. You know? Mm. So I've done a lot of stuff, but I, 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 I told myself I will never kill someone. But I've done the work they wanted me to do. So currently I was in the I was in the darkness but now I mean I'm in the light. So I recruit people for the light now. So do you think it's too late for him? No. It will never be too late for an individual that is still alive. If if you're still alive you have hope to to make yourself better. You have hope to become a better person. I set up a meeting with Mary. Um, she was shot uh, in a league. I think about two years ago. And has she fully recovered from the shot? No, there's no blood circulating in her leg. Really? Yeah, there's like a hole in her leg as well. Oh my word. She's not doing well. Oh. She's, not, she's not doing well at all. Hi, Mary. Mary, the last time I saw you, you were actually lying in that room next to us uh, in, in bed. You were just recovering from, from your injuries. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm good, but I had my third operation. Um, the plate and the screws went loose and the leg got infected, so I had to do another operation. Tell me, um, 
I mean, obviously, what happened one and a half years ago is still affecting your life. Maybe you can recall the moments of that fateful day. I mean, what, what, what happened on that day that you were shot? Uh, it was on the 2nd of July. I was busy hanging my washing. I heard the first gunshot. And then as I turned, the second bullet got me in my leg. And so I fell down and I couldn't move. And it was a close call, you almost died, I believe. Huh? Yes, yes, uh, it was a hollow point though. So the bullet burst in my knee, uh, cut the artery, I break the bone. That day changed my whole life. After that, everything changed. For me, it said I, I can't do anything yet with the children. Because you took care of many children here in the, in the neighborhood and you tried to help them out of poverty, keep them away from gang violence, and, and, and now you kind of feel you can't do this work anymore. Yeah, I do. I feel very despondent because I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help my kids. And even the children in the program. Like this one boy, he died, and he was such a humble boy and he died so young and the program stopped because I couldn't manage the program because I couldn't walk and I couldn't do things for them. I usually do it with them. So what happened is um, after I got shot, I got stopped. I believe I got stopped. I couldn't do anything for them and I used to do so much. So basically every time when I think about it, I'm a victim to violence to the community and I just felt maybe I will never walk again. But by the grace of God, I'm walking and I can still do and I still want to do for these kids. And basically when this happened to me, it also crippled my family. And my husband and it also crippled our family financially because when my husband had to look after me for two and a half months. He's a truck driver and couldn't work during that time, huh? Yeah, he, couldn't, he didn't go to work. He took um, leave and it was unpaid leave, so basically it put me backwards. And there was also a case where one of the children was actually shot almost in front of your door, isn't it? What, what happened there? When, when, when did this happen? Uh, it got to five. Uh, that Sunday morning, the both of them got shot. One had seven bullets in his head and the other one had nine bullets. So basically it was just in front of my door on this side. Yeah, this is pretty much opposite yes. the street, huh? And then they said to me, it's Dawood. And Dawood was one of the boys that was very close to me. He came in my house. It was part of your program, basically. Part of the program, but like a son to me. So the one boy was lying here. As you can see, there's wow, still blood only, stains here. We're only like 10 meters away from your apartment, huh? Yeah. Let's say the blood stain. Still the blood stains here. It was laying here over. Everybody was traumatized by the fact that these two young boys, like they died that morning, you know. So what, I mean, it, it almost sounds as if so many good people like you tried everything. The government has tried pretty much everything. So what needs to happen for this to stop? If we as a community can become unity, then there's power to overtake these gangsters. Ja, jetzt komme ich gerade aus Marys Haus raus und das war schon sehr, sehr bewegend für mich, ähm, ihre offene Wunde zu sehen nach anderthalb Jahren. Und ja, was man wirklich realisiert ist, wie, wie groß die Konsequenzen von einem Schuss sein können. Ja, auch anderthalb Jahre später noch auf, auf das Leben von so vielen anderen, die, die davon letztendlich getroffen werden. Ihr Programm ist mehr oder weniger zerbröse, muss man wirklich sagen. Sie hat hier 50 Kinder früher, ähm, hat auf sie aufgepasst, hat sie versucht, von den Gangs fernzuhalten. Vor einem Monat gab es mehrere Tote hier direkt vor ihrer Haustür. Und ja, es, es hört nicht auf und das, ähm, ja, das, äh, das macht schon sehr betroffen. Macht wirklich betroffen. Tschüss, Glenn, that was, that was shocking, huh? I mean, it's, it makes me realize how one bullet actually can have an effect on 50 other lies, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. It's a ripple effect. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's breaking down positivity movement in the community when someone good like Mary was shot. So, yeah, that is what is happening. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's go, man. Huh?
Okay, Glenn, uh, excuse me, we obviously have left uh, the cave flats now. Uh, where are you taking me? If you hire this guy and you want to change your life, you need to go out of the place and come back um, as a new person yeah, in the community. <laughs> Alright, man. Alright, bro, man. Alright, this is Chris. You must be Bruce. Yes, Chris. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So that's where you stay, huh? Yeah, we are at Camp Joy. Uh huh. And um, it's nice to have you here, man. Thank you, thank you. Let me show you the, the garden. This is our, our, our cauliflower. They planted this morning. Mm -hmm. Alright? So the hay is like, um, it protects it a little from the sun and the soil. So what's the biggest challenge about leaving a gang? I mean, obviously, I know you've been, you have a bit of a drug history. Yes, uh, is is yes. that the biggest challenge or is it uh, the old friendships, the old ties to the old gang members? You see, that, that lifestyle is also addictive, man. Because of a lot of, a lot of elements, first of all, money, women, you know, and the, the, the fame, like you can say it, the fame that you get, and that is why I want to I want to get youngsters to, I want to get a message to the youngsters to tell them this isn't the life forward, man. I learned a lot here, man. You know, the people that I met here, they accepted me for who I am mm. and for what I was doing outside, you know what I mean? So I feel like there's a little bit of love that I was looking for, I find it here. My father was, he was also back in the day a little bit of a gangster, you understand? He told me, I changed my life because of you. You understand? So that you don't grow up in this. But unfortunately, I took that same path as he did, and I just did it worse. When he passed away, that is when I said to myself that I don't want to live, to live like this anymore, because he's gone now. And I think he had to go away for me to open my eyes and say, nah, I don't want to live like this because it's just it's chaos, man. Mm. It's chaos. Not and just for you, but also for the people you're interacting with, huh? Yeah. Well, what, what, about, what, about, what about a normal job? Who's gonna hire a criminal? If you look at just two, two things on my, on my record, murder and theft, who's gonna hire a murder and a thief? That will be the case when you leave this program. So what's, what's, gonna, what's gonna happen if you apply for jobs and then that's still going to be on your on your record, isn't it? That is why. That is why um, I'm trying to do something now. Mm. You know, so that it's not too late for me to to change. Mm. To understand. Obviously, your past will always be part of you. I mean, you can see it in your tattoos. I think you mm. you have some tattoos here as well. That yes. Would you yes. mind showing them as well? No problem. And this is my position here. Your general. Mm. Yeah. Is that the highest position within the, the gang? One of the highest ranks, mm. you understand? So, and um, so there's the leader, and then that's the second, second. Yeah, you can of say you can say I'm second in command. Second in command. Uh, so you you've been here now for three months, and you said you 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 relapsed, relapsed a couple of times already, like yes. three times, I believe. Uh, three times. With drugs, you still didn't leave the program, but you you no. relapsed. Uh, uh, so how how likely is it that you're going to succeed? Are you are you over the mountain already? Did you, did you succeed already? Do you think you're going to pull through from here or is it still a bit of a shaky ground? Oh, we won't say it's still shaky. We'll say I'm coming down the mountain. You know, my mind is, 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 is starting to wake up out of the coma it was in what the drugs kept my brain in. Mm. So I'm starting to reason like a normal person, you understand? And that urge to use drugs isn't there anymore. Bruce, would you mind showing me around a little bit? Maybe the garden and then also the other programs here you're doing Okay, here? no yeah. problem, All no right. problem, Let's we go. can do that. The cabbages and the spring onions, the spinach, that goes for the feeding scheme in the Nova Park, mm -hmm. right? And it goes for the centre as well. And that's how we, you know, we make the nice salads, we make nice cabbage breathies, mm. and we like it because we eat a lot here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do much gardening. Should how do you feel like when you when you do gardening? I mean, what does it do to you mentally? I feel like I'm at home here, man. When I'm in the garden, it's almost like the plants. The plants understand me. Any bullet could have killed me. Mm. You know. Were, were you hit by bullets? Yeah, in my head. Here, you see, I got the scar here. Oh yeah. Oh my. That could have killed me. Mm. You know what I mean? What makes me so special? I'm asking. I ask God that. 
Mm. What makes me so special? What? Why mm. am I still alive? Mm. And I think that's why I'm here, man, to help the other guys, man. To be honest, it doesn't look like it's gonna be an easy part. No, for sure. But I'm determined to to stick it out till the end. Mm. You know. Mm. Thank you guys for for coming and having this chat with me. Made me understand your situation a lot better. And thanks so much for being so open about your story. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. All right, go well, eh? Safe, guys. All the best. Okay, das war also Bruce. Bis vor drei Monaten einer der Anführer der 27er Gangs, wahrscheinlich die berüchtigste Gangs hier in Kapstadt. Und äh, ja, wenn man ihn so trifft, eigentlich ein umgänglicher Typ. Ähm, und dann äh, erzählt er einem von den zahlreichen Menschen, die er getötet hat. Ähm, und ja, er gibt selber zu, dass es ein schwieriger Weg ist, der vor ihm ist. Ähm, Drogensucht, äh, aber auch letztendlich eine ja, hohe Akzeptanz seines Lebensstils in, in Teilen seines Umfelds, wo er dann teilweise bei Jugendlichen als Vorbild galt. Und man muss wirklich hoffen, dass er das schafft, diesen Ausstieg. Er sagt selber, dass das eine ganz, ganz schwierige Aufgabe für ihn wird. Aber ja, ich meine, wenn ich ganz ehrlich bin, bin ich nicht ganz überzeugt, dass er schafft. Aber ja, machen wir das Beste für ihn hoffen. Out of all the conversations we had, what was the one element that stood out for you? So was there something that surprised you, even as a, as a local? No, the, the biggest thing that stood out for me over these two days is the mere fact of Auntie Mary. Mm. The Mary really stood out for me mm. um, about the ripple effect mm. of shooting out over, over a lot of lives, mm. especially young kids. That also became yeah. quite obvious for you. Huh? Yeah, I, I never looked in such a bigger picture. Mm. And when she spoke about it, it really touched me. Mm. And also, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, that really touched me, you know. It, Glenn, yeah. was good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Was good to see you again. Eh? Take care. Chef, cheers. Ja, wir haben heute gestern in erster Linie die negativen Aspekte dieser Nachbarschaft äh, begutachtet. Aber man muss auch wirklich sagen, egal welche Geschichte man hier in Südafrika macht, man findet auch oft positive Aspekte. Und äh, Glenns Leben hat sich die letzten Monate sehr positiv entwickelt. Er hat wieder Arbeit gefunden. Er hat äh, ein tolles Sportprojekt hier angefangen. Und äh, ja, er ist letztendlich ein Beispiel. Wie der, so mancher Ex-Gangster hier, der ganz am Anfang des Ausstiegs steht, ist Glenn einer, der es wirklich geschafft hat. Und ähm, am Ende des Tages, solange es solche Beispiele gibt, gibt es auch Hoffnung hier für die Cape Flats. Das sind tatsächlich schwer zu verdauende Eindrücke. Auf der anderen Seite finde ich es auch ermutigend zu sehen, dass es selbst in den armen Vierteln Kapstadt einen Lichtblick gibt. Was haltet ihr von unserer Folge? Schreibt es uns in die Kommentare und vergesst nicht, den Channel zu abonnieren. In zwei Wochen schauen wir in die deutsche Hauptstadt Berlin. Unser Investigativreporter Ibrahim Naber berichtet über das von linksradikalen Teil besetzte Haus Riga 94. Diese Leute wollen mit Gewalt, mit Straftaten anderen Menschen das aufzwingen, was sie glauben. Falls euch noch andere Folgen von uns interessieren, wir verlinken euch hier auch noch die Pilotfolge von unserer US-Wahlberichterstatterin Carolina Drüten. Die hat in den USA eine Influencerin getroffen aus der Latino-Community, die Trump-Anhängerin ist. Das war's von uns. Dankeschön und bis bald.